Um, our speaker right now is Borbalo Banto, and I'm so privileged and honored to introduce her. Thank you. Thank you, Jeanette, and uh, thank you, Jeanette and Heather, for inviting me. It's an honor to be here with you. I got to know a good number of you uh, over the co last couple of years. And uh, I have to tell you that I consider your business model and your franchise, virtual franchise, like the best small business in the world when you can merge having your own business and earning extra income with being an evangelist for health and nutrition and caring for your bodies and uh, for the next generation, I think is just the best business. So congratulations that for your business and to be here. Okay. Um, so I have the best slot right after lunch. Everybody's digesting. We had a great lunch. But um, let me ask you a couple of questions and I want like answers with a show of hands. Uh, who here is satisfied with the taxes that they pay? <laughs> Nobody? Really? Uh, the first tax return this season in my firm was a tax return of a sm um, young attorney who is single, has two kids. After all the deductions, uh, his, uh, her profit was about $40,000. And uh, because of the two kids and all the credits and earned income credit that comes with it, she did not pay any tax. No social security, no income tax. So I guess a person like that would be okay with their taxes, right? But most of us, we, we do pay tax and we are not satisfied with them. Um, who here is uh, pretty confident that they take advantage of every tax credit or deduction that they are entitled to? One, a couple of them. Very good, super. Um, Congratulations, yeah. And the last question is, who is very confident that their tax advisor is doing a proactive job letting them know any new tax credits or deduction that may apply to them if their situation changes? A couple of them. Super, super. Congratulations. <laughs> um, Let's see if this works. This is what Albert Einstein said. So we are dealing with something that is in our lives constantly. If you have a W-2 job, taxes are already taken out. If you have a distributor uh, business, then uh, we need to pay tax at year end if you have profits. There was a Charles Schwab ad uh, like a decade ago that said, you need to pay your taxes, but nobody says you have to leave a tip. So that's what kind of my, my uh, motto here. And I for sure don't want to leave a tip because of three, these three guys here. Uh, Christopher, Juliana, and Claudia, five, three, and one. And so I'm busy with paying for diapers and daycare and school. So. And also, I have a legal education, and I'm a CPA, so I don't want to get into trouble with the IRS, right? I have uh, respect for the law and uh, for the IRS, but I don't want to leave a tip. So when I started my practice, uh, we started it on a foundation of being really proactive, finding out what are the legitimate deductions and credits that my clients can take, and I can bring them uh, these, uh, these opportunities to save on taxes, but we don't want to do anything aggressive. Orange stripe uh, jumpsuits don't look good on me, I think, and not on my clients. So it's, it's not something that we want to uh, attempt. So we don't want to get into trouble with the law, but we don't want to uh, leave a tip. And we want to use every, every available tax deduction. So after these three questions, and the answers we gave them, I have a good news and a bad news. And the bad news is that you probably are paying too much tax. And probably you're not taking advantage of every tax credit and deduction that you are entitled to. And probably your tax advisor is not proactive enough to bring you those. If you show up at your CPA's door April 15th with a stack of receipts or a shoebox, it's too late to do anything about the previous year, right? There's nothing anybody can do. So you have to be proactive during the year, and you're just 
um, starting to uh, 2014. So it's a very good time to think about these things and ask your tax advisor about these um, opportunities. We are gonna talk about, just go back one second. We're gonna talk about 10 tips that I jot down after working with Juice Plus distributors and seeing what questions they asked me and what kind of issues they dealt with. Uh, we are gonna talk about 10 planning tips for this year's taxes. Just before we begin, let's just recap of what type of taxes are we, pay, are we paying here in Ohio. So it's Social Security and Medicare, right? That's a fat, flat percentage. If you are a W-2 employee, you pay half of it, 7.65%. Uh, Your employers matches it, and together you're gonna send 15.3% Social Security and Medicare tax to the US Treasury. If you are uh, in, uh, have a small business, then you have to pay both sides 15.3% of the profit, right? So we have the gross income, the 1099 that we get from Juice Plus, all the deductions, and then we, we are left with the profit. We pay tax on the profit. Then we pay income tax. People sometimes ask me, how much money should I put away for taxes from my Juice Plus check? And of course, the perfect answer to that is, it depends. <laughs> It depends how much expenses you have, how many conferences you go to, how many team meetings you hold, how, you know, how many miles you drive. So it depends on your deductions. But as far as tax on the profit, I can tell you Social Security and Medicare again is 15.3%. But for your income tax, I would need to see the whole picture. If I earned $1,000 profit from my Juice Plus business and I'm single, and I pay taxes, just me on the tax return, how much will my effective tax rate be on that $1,000? Probably nothing, right? Especially if I don't have other income. If I have another W-2 job and I earn $100,000, how much my effective tax rate is gonna be? 25%? So my 1,000 little juice plus profit will be taxed 25% as well. So I need to put away 25% plus 15 for Social Security and Medicare, that's 40 already, plus about three for Ohio, and two for local. So, yeah. if somebody happens to be in Kentucky, uh, live in Kentucky or Florida or Texas, they don't pay local or state, so they are lucky. But they still have federal and Social Security. So, the good news is that we can plan and we can have a better plan of how we calculate the taxes, what deductions we have, what tax credits we have. So let's start with number one. This is something all Juice Plus virtual franchises have. You take out your team members, your prospective clients, uh, your prospects, your referral sources, your colleagues to a business lunch. And let's just talk about meals and entertainment that happens at your tax base, which is in town, right? So the law says you can deduct 50% of that. Because they know that part of it is personal, because you need to eat anyways. But if there is a bona fide business discussion happening while at the meeting, at the uh, dinner or breakfast or, or lunch, you can put that as a deduction on your tax return. Now, if I want to be more aggressive, the question is, how many times do I go out for dinner with my husband and not talk about business? I mean, it didn't happen to me yet, but I'm sure my husband is still waiting for it. But uh, we always talk about business. At least I always talk about business, and, and especially if he's a part of my business or my employee, right? We always talk about business. How many times do you go out to dinner with somebody who's not a potential client? I mean, I know, I know Jeanette. I'm sure every time she goes out or meets somebody, she's gonna talk about Juice Plus, right? So depending on how much your income is, of course, we have to have a common sense. Question is, how far do we wanna push this? Do we wanna really have a business discussion? Do we have a business discussion? Do we wanna convert somebody to be Juice Plus distributor? Is that a business meal or not, right? So. Um, It's one thought. The other part is when we are out of town, we are traveling to a conference, then the law says, even if you are by yourself, you have to have dinner 
uh, lunch and dinner, three meals a day, you can deduct that. In the in town, if you're eating alone, you cannot really have a business discussion for yourself. So basically, <laughs> only if you have somebody else with you, that's a deduction. But when you're traveling, then the law says, this is outside of your tax base, of course you can deduct it. Now, I have the um, actual cost versus standard meal allowance uh, as a note. And um, when I told about this to one of my Juice Plus clients, it, it was a new concept, so I, I uh, wanted to put that on the slides. If you're really frugal, or don't really like to eat that much when you travel out overnight outside of your tax base, the law says that they give you a per diem rate, and the IRS has this list for every major city in the US and also international, of how much they think three meals a day costs in that city. That varies from like 39 to 64, like Manhattan being very expensive, or maybe Ohio, it's, it's on the lower end. It's in your benefit to use that per diem rate. Look it up or have your CPA look it up if you really are frugal and you're not eating a lot. But, or very cheap, but if, uh, of course, if actual expenses are more than the 39 or $64, then it is in your benefit to keep all the receipts. Let's talk about receipts. The law says that they're interested in five things when we're talking about meals and entertainment. How much was it? When did it happen? Where did it happen? What was the business purpose? And what is the business relationship? If you get a check at a restaurant, when did it happen? It's already on the receipt. Where? It's already on the receipt. How much? It's already on the receipt. So why don't we turn the check and write down on the back of it the people we had dinner with and what did we talk about? The law says that we don't have to keep the actual receipts, and we're gonna talk about record keeping later, but we don't necessarily have to keep the paper copy of the receipts. They sell these neat scanners, little scanners. There are apps for it. You can take a picture of the front and the back of the receipt. Just keep it. If you, God forbid, would be audited, and there is a thing called random audit, it's totally random, about 10,000 people a year are, re are randomly audited for the IRS to just get feedback of what are people doing. Uh, if you put a couple of thousand dollars on meals and entertainment on the tax return, they would need to see, for the majority of it at least, uh, receipts. So it's a very good, very good um, idea to keep the receipt, especially for things that people abuse, and this would be one of them. Just, oh, I don't know, I spent, X amount and I'm gonna put it on the tax return. So it's better if we, if we just know the exact number, right? So let's talk about entertainment. Yeah. Meals and entertainment. Also, I forgot to mention, meals don't just happen at restaurants or dining out, right? If you have a team meeting in your house and you go to Heinen's or Giant Eagle to purchase the food, that's also Deduction. If you entertain your team in your house that's, and you have a bona fide business like team Christmas party, bona fide business reason, it's a deduction. What about associated entertainment? The law says that if there was a bona fide business discussion before or after the entertainment that occurred, Entertainment being a sports game, theater, concert. Not during, because they say yeah, if you're a concert, you pretty much cannot talk about business during or, or the, the concert or the theater. Um, if you can plan having a business discussion or a team meeting before or after, that associated entertainment becomes a business deduction. Face value of the tickets, parking, tips, and of course we talked about the meals. So those are good tips. I forgot to mention, we're gonna have a Q&A after the presentation, so jot down your questions, please, and we're gonna have more than 15 minutes for your questions, and also we're gonna stick around, so everybody, if anybody has any questions afterwards, uh, we make sure that nobody goes home. Uh, <laughs> I live very close, so. 
going to be fine. So the second uh, tip would be car expenses, auto expenses. Now the questions, not, just not to fall asleep. Um, this is a survey by AAA of how much actually it costs different size of, for different size of car to drive one mile, right? We know that the IRS standard mileage is 56 cents this year. You, last year it was 56 and a half cents. But depending on what type of car we drive or what shape our car is in, it could be that we can get a higher deduction using the actual costs than by using the standard. And this is, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but just a show of hand, who is driving um, like a sedan here? Who is driving a minivan? Let's say for business. Who is driving an SUV? Who is driving a hammer? I have a client in uh, Texas, uh, a lawyer who's a criminal lawyer who's driving this huge Hummer car and his gas bills, I mean, just outrageous, right? So if we look at this survey, if you get reimbursed 56 cents a mile if you drive a minivan, but it's costing you 63.3, that you lose every time you turn the key, right? And if you see the, the bottom of the slide, it says $2.603 per gallon. <laughs> Come on. Where is that? Yeah. Egypt or whatever. <laughs> so, <laughs> so just make sure that this is something that you bring up. Again, this has to be looked at every year because it, is, it could be better that the standard is just fine and it gives you a higher deduction. And also there are some rules of you cannot just go back and forth between the two different calculations year by year. So, for example, if I work from home, so my personal miles and school of my kids is half mile from my house. So let's say I drive 100 miles a month for personal reason. And I also only drive 100 miles for business purpose. If I use the standard deduction, then how much, how much uh, deduction does it give me a month? <laughs> 56 bucks a month, right? So let's say that's about 600 bucks a year if I use the standard mileage, because I only drove 100 miles for business purpose a month. But what if I use the actual? So let's say my car needs a very expensive repair, and I paid $5,000 repair that year. And my insurance is you know, 600 bucks a year. So altogether, I spent about $6,000 on my car that year. How much is my business use of the car? I drove 100 miles for personal reasons, 100 for business. So 50% is the, my business usage. If I go with the actual, how much would that give me as a deduction? Spent $6,000 on the car. So half of it? 3,000, so perfect. So this is just something that don't just take your Tax preparers questions like, oh, how many miles did you drive? Hmm, okay, bye. Here's your number. Just make sure that you know you investigate every year if, if you should change to actual or what's going on. As far as record keeping for mileage, and I ask, I get this question a lot. Of course, it's better, it's the best if you have a planner, journal, and you put down all your mileage. Not including when you go and see prospective clients or team meetings, but also when you go to see your CPA, when you go to Office Max to buy office supplies, when you go to Best Buy to buy a flash drive, those are all business miles. Law also says that if you don't want to keep a total record for the whole year, why don't you just keep a record for two months and you average it out and use that miles for the whole year? But if you have a growing business, is that in your benefit? No. no. So, with tax planning, there's always something that we need to do. It's if we are proactive, we can win. Otherwise, it's, it's hard. So there's always something. If we keep all the meals and entertainment receipts, if we add together all the mileages, but it takes effort. It takes a little time and it takes effort. Next tip, home office deduction. This used to be the most controversial deduction. 
and even CPAs were afraid to use it because it was a red flag, represented a red flag on the tax return. A couple of years ago, the Congress uh, gave us easier rules, so now I don't think it's a red flag anymore. Most of you, if you have your virtual franchise, your distributors, your home is your, there's a place in your home that's your home office, that's your home base, tax base, right? If you don't have another office or another um, place outside your home where you keep your samples or inventory and stuff like that. Um, there was a case, a court case years ago with teachers. Teachers said, we want, we, we think we have a home office because we grade papers at home and they lost the case. The IRS said, no, you don't have a home office. And what was the reason? The reason was that most of them, or at least in this court case, when they were asked where they grade those papers, they said, on the kitchen table, in the kitchen. So in your house, you have to have a specific place. It doesn't have to be a whole room, but it can be a part of your basement, part of your living room, part of one room, but it has to be a place where you exclusively use for administrative and general um, activities of your business. Emailing, so you have your laptop there, you have a desk, you keep your stuff there, but you exclusively should use it for, for business. Then you take, a, you measure how much space you occupy in your home office, and you measure the whole square footage of the house. You can, and a lot of people are not doing this, you can eliminate common areas, hallways, staircases, um, bathrooms. So if you have three bedrooms that you can go with one third, you have to right, add together all the expenses for your home. Uh, mortgage, property taxes, utilities, security, cleaning, depreciation, and then you take a percentage of this on the tax return as an expense. The point there that increases business miles is that you don't have a commute. If this is your office, every time you leave from here, going anywhere, it's a business mileage. Otherwise, let's say my office is in Independence, so my driving from Braxville to Independence is commute. So if I go to see my clients from Independence, only the independence and going to the client and back to independence is my deductible mileage. For you, offices in your home, every time you go somewhere from home, you can put in MapQuest, how far is it? And if you go, I have clients who go regularly to like a team meeting, networking meeting every uh, week. They just know how much it is, put it in your planner. 50, 50 weeks a year, I went once a week and it was 20 miles. If you buy any home uh, office furniture, shelving, if you have, redo, you have to remodel, chair, change the carpet in your home office, those are all business deductions. So make sure that you don't forget about a shelf or picture on the wall, art. Here's a good time to mention that we need to have common sense when we talk about taxes. If I earn, let's say, $100,000 from my juice bus business, and I buy a piece of art for my office, and I see clients there, I don't think that any IRS agent would question that piece of art, especially if it's not like $100,000. But if I consistently earn $500, just $1,000 a year, and I, every year I bought, buy $5,000 worth of art for my home office. <laughs> yeah. So just common sense. The IRS says that if you have profits in your business, three out of every five years, losses, three, uh, profit three out of five years, it's fine, especially in the beginning. You started in October, you, you went, you started with going to a conference, you barely made any money, you're gonna have a loss, and that's fine. But then overall, after a while, they could question, is this a hobby? If it would be a real business and not just a hobby, you would transition to make a profit, right? So just um, 
have some common sense of how much our expenses are. And the same thing with the, with the meals and entertainment. If I have as gross income in my business, $100,000, and I spend $5,000 on meals and entertainment, and I'm a team leader, that would not be questioned. But if I earn $1,000 every year and I spend $5,000 on music and entertainment, again, it's, that would be a red flag. So let's talk about family employment. If we would use our kids, or in some of the cases, grandkids, to work in our business and shift let's say $6,000, and that amount has shifted the first 6,100 this year. They would earn that in a year, tax-free, because they would not pay any tax on it, versus me earning the money and paying 25%. What is the difference? That's a lot of, lot of um, the tax money that I saved. The law says that kids above seven years old can do stuff, they, they, they can work in your unincorporated business. So if you can find something, print these out for me, like for your teenage kids, work on my website, set up my computer. Um, in other cases, if you have rental property, mow the lawn. How much would you have to pay for a commercial landscaping company to mow the lawn? So you have to adjust the rate that you're paying your kids accordingly to their age, but they, they can do the work. How much would you have to pay for a commercial web designer? Again, adjust it. If you pay your kids effectively, they will have very, very low 0 or 10% tax rate versus you having a higher tax rate. Of course, just to be very strict, and you should have a uh, job description. They should have a timesheet. You should pay them with a check and deposit it in their checking account, right? That could be a Roth IRA. It doesn't have to be their Nintendo and pizza fund, right? You could deposit it into their Roth IRAs because now they're earning money. So everybody who earns, earned, has earned income, at least $5,000, they can put it in a retirement account. Let's say we're talking about the Roth IRA. You pay tax on it before you put it in, but the tax is zero. So you put the whole money in a Roth IRA. There are some um, calculations that if you would do this for 10 years, kid from age of 8 to 18 would earn $5,000 a year, and you would put it in a Roth IRA, a very, very conservative investment. By the time they would retire, and then you stop. You stop at 18. So 10 years, you put in $50,000. If you wait till they retire, they are 65, they would have a million dollars. So when I heard this example, the presenter said, do you think that they would really thank you <laughs> for that, to, you know, being that proactive to do that? But also, um, you can use this money, or the kid can use this money. You cannot use it for anything that is your parental obligation, but private school, Parochial school is not a parental obligation. Uh, sending them to summer camp, it's not your obligation, so you could use this money. Let's say your teenage daughter wants to go two weeks on a horse camp. If you earn the money, pay 40% tax on it, then write a check to the camp, versus they can earn the money with 0% tax rate and pay for the camp out of their account. What is the difference? For every thousand dollars, it would be a four hundred dollar difference. So, uh, so it's worth to look into it, especially if your kids are involved and are helping you. Of course, if they earn money, they have to have a W two at your end. But that is painless versus how much you you can save. And also, most of you are don't have an LLC, so it's an unincorporated business. If you issue a W-2 to your kids, or like family member, you don't even have to withhold Social Security and Medicare. So just imagine, that's 15% above the income tax. So it's, it, it's something that a lot of people who are really proactive are using. 
want to just touch on the right business entity. As I said, most of us start out as unincorporated. We just get a w, uh, 1099 from Juice Plus at year end and put it on a Schedule C in our tax returns. But later, maybe later you want to have an LLC because you think, I'm doing other stuff and maybe I want some protection for liability. And you know, I heard from other people that LLC is the way to go. If you are single member LLC, you are still taxed the same way. Later, you might want to ask the IRS to tax you differently. And you would need the help of, of a tax advisor for this, but I'm just gonna um, mention the S Corp. S Corp, you can still have an LLC, just file some forms with the IRS, and you are taxed as a corporation. You never had to have a corporation. You are just taxed as a corporation. If, when you get to about $50,000 profit, in your business. You can save with 50,000, and you, then you ask the IRS for an S-Corp status. What you, what you would save would be about $3,500. Okay, for some people, I don't care about it. For some people, hey, that is like half of my yearly vacation fund, right? With $6,000, you can go on an uh, all-inclusive Mexico week. Right? So, especially if you earn more, and this is the profit we're talking about. After deduction, you have profit at least $50,000. Of course, there are some things that you have to do, like you would have to, the business would have a separate tax return. So, you know, you have to pay for that. You have to have a W-2 from your business, so you have to have an accountant prepare a W-2 and some payroll forms. But even the net difference would, could be a couple of thousand dollars. I have clients that every year in the beginning of the year, they they're just you know, wake up and, we already had seven or six, seven of them this year who said, let's look at it. Let's look at it and let's do something. Of course, I remind them all throughout the year, but it's like, oh, I don't want to deal with it. But then when I show, you know what? You could go on a cruise for this, this money. And just imagine, that's one year. $3,000 one year. What about 10 years? 30 grand. That's a pretty good car. So there are some things that when, if you're proactive, Ask your tax advisor about it, and uh, you could save some serious money. Tip number six. This is something that like, people are not using, and it's just they're really missing out, out on a lot of tax money savings. There's a thing called medical expense reimbursement plan. Every business can have it. You might have heard about it. Uh, it's also called Section 105 plan. It's an employee benefit plan. If you have a business, as you are a business owner, you can say, all my employees qualify to have this. What it means is any expenses, medical expenses, that you have that insurance doesn't cover, you have to cover them out of pocket. I'm going to reimburse you for it. Of course, if you have employees outside of your family, you might not want to be really generous to, to include everybody, but what if your employees, your spouse? Like most of us don't have employees outside the family, right? So I have my Juice Plus, Juice Plus business, let's say, and I hire my spouse to do my newsletter, you know, other stuff, but they're a bona fide employee. I cannot be an employee as an LLC, single member, or unincorporated business, I cannot have cannot be my own business's employee, so I need an employee. So who can be my employee? My spouse. So then the law says, this spouse of mine and all his family, which includes me, right? And my kids, <laughs> right? Any unreimbursed medical expenses that they have, I can reimburse them out of the business account, or I can pay for it directly. I have a client who is an attorney in Minnesota, and he has three kids. One is special needs. He goes to his uh, chiropractor, uh, family doctor for everything and gets prescription on everything. Tylenol for the kids that you can buy out of, you know, over the counter, but he gets a prescription. So now it becomes a deduction under this plan. He got a prescription for his vitamins and mineral supplements. I don't know about Juice Plus, because like, really it's food, right? It's considered food. but. If you get a prescription for it, some of my clients got a prescription for the massage after like an accident or chiropractic visits. 
uh, special bed, special mattress, trainer in some cases. This client of mine in Minnesota last year, we just added it up, his deductions totaled $18,000. So all his out-of-pocket medical expenses for the family was $18,000 a year. So he can either earn the money as a lawyer, pay tax on it, take home the money, and then pay the $18,000. How much would you have to earn to net $18,000? I don't know, $25,000, $30,000? Versus if he has this plan, and he says, my wife works for me in the, in the business, so he's, she's covered then on my kids and I'm covered through her. Of course, she has to be proactive of logging into an Excel all the expenses every time they go to CVS or different things. So you have to toll them up. At your end, she reimbursed herself $18,000 before any tax. If you pay toll of 40% tax, that's about $7,000 savings. I'm not sure why more people are not using this plan, but for a little business who's not incorporated and doesn't have out of family employees, it's perfect. Of course, there are some technicalities that you have to have with it. You have to have a plan, has like a plan language. Your CPA or anybody who is really proactive can provide you with this plan document. And you cannot just show up at your uh, CPA's office December and say, oh, I had all these medical expenses. Can we have a plan for last year? Right? But this is the perfect time to sign and have a plan like this documented for 2014. Um, what is included? You know, we touched on it. Everything. I had clients who said, we are young, healthy, don't really go to the doctor. We don't need this. Turned out they wanted kids. They need fertility treatment. Insurance doesn't cover it. $30,000 to in vitro. So that's something that immediately her situation changed, and she was able to pay herself, reimburse herself before taxes for this huge amount. So everything is, everything is covered that you can have. Uh, either you pay to the doctor, to a lab, eye doctor, dentist, or you can get a prescription for it. Copays, deductibles. Braces, huge expense for people who have kids. So that's why we said this plan lets you deduct your daughter's braces as a business expense. Technically, really. When we says non-prescription medication and supplies, I should have put in there only when you get a prescription for it. So it's not any out of over-the-counter stuff. You, if you have a prescription for that, for that vitamin C, yes, you can deduct it. Otherwise. It's just over the counter. It's so much better than the HSAs, where you have to put in a special account money every month, and you have to calculate how much do I have in there, how much I'm taking out, I have to work with the bank. This is basically an accounting method of converting these expenses from after tax to pre tax. So you don't need any special accounts to open. You can have a business credit card to pay for your medical expenses outright using the business credit card or toll them up, up like a reimbursement request and reimburse yourself. There is a place on the tax return to put these expenses on. That's, you know, many of you know, the item on Schedule A, first paragraphs asking you how much unreimbursed out-of-pocket medi medical expenses you have. The problem with that is it used to be 7.5, now starting this year, it's 10% floor. So let's say if I do have $5,000 out of pocket medical expense, I do not have this MERP plan, I can still try to put that on my personal tax return, Schedule A, but then it's going to ask me, so what is 10% of your AGI? Let's say my husband and I earn $100,000, 10% of that is $10,000. I don't qualify, right? So it's so much better than that. It's also because if you re this is a business deduction, then you don't pay Social Security, Medicare, or income tax on it. Tip number seven. A lot of distributors are asking me about not being sure what expense category they should use. When talking about office expenses, is it marketing, is it advertising, is it office expense, office equipment, what's going on? 
law says business gifts, and I see this on tax returns that I review a lot. It says business gifts, $500. said, okay. The law says only $25 that you give to somebody, one person per year is deductible. So if you give somebody a $100 business, uh, gift card, only 25 of it is deductible. So if I see business gifts, 100 bucks on the tax return, basically that was four people, $25 each. So I ask the taxpayer, is that what you did? Is that how this 100 bucks came together? Oh, no, no, I just bought one gift card of 100 and gave it to my team leader or whatever. It's like, yeah, that's, that's not good. So the question is, are you really giving business gifts or are you paying for some marketing expense? So it, if you put business gifts and a huge amount on your tax return, it could be a red flag because of this law. If you say that was for marketing, because really you are building your brand, you're marketing yourself, and you want to build your team, and you're spending a lot on that, putting together events and buying all kinds of things, posters and stuff like that, that is really marketing. So you should characterize it and say it was marketing. If it was in print or on the internet, that's advertising. Marketing is a broader uh, definition. Advertising is, is more specific. Office supplies. This is really a catch-all category. Sometimes when I review tax returns, I see uh, everything in there. Uniform, meals, team meals, which shouldn't be there, some travel expense, all kinds of different things. Office supplies, toner for your printer, you know, paper, business cards, which is a business cards could really go under marketing as well. Luckily in the US, we don't have these very strict categories that like every, every seat, somebody's gonna look at it and if you didn't put in the right category, then they're gonna penalize you. But still, we should do as good of a job as we can. With the office supplies, most of my clients just think that office equipment goes under that as well. So you always should, should categorize that differently because it goes to a different uh, place on the tax return and it gets depreciated. So if it's something that lasts more than a year, phone, of course car, printer, of course like nowadays we really think that they don't last more than a year, but uh, printer, computer, laptop, Kindle, iPod, iPad, furniture, those are depreciable categories. So we shouldn't put that under office supplies. If you give awards to your team members, that should really go under the awards and not business gifts and, and maybe not marketing either. Tip number eight, keep your receipts. And it doesn't have to be on paper, as we said. I have clients who, after they toll up everything, they go to the like UPS store where they have scanners, and they just scan in all the receipts in a PDF, five of them on a page. They don't keep the receipts anymore. They just keep the PDF. They scan them in. As I said, we could take a picture of it. You can use a neat scanner. You can use an app for it. But keep your receipts for at least three years. Under special circumstances, the IRS can come back after six years to audit you, but really, if you don't do such a bad job, then three years, and then you can uh, get, get rid of them. But luckily, none of my clients got audited uh, so far, but I did have a university professor that came into my office, prepared his own tax returns, I don't know why, but IRS audited him for one year, seeing what they found, extended it to two years, wanted $45,000 from him. So my office is very close to the IRS office, so we just stumbled in the building, saw my name in the directory, came up, and said, can you help me? And uh, so I went to the IRS. I do not recommend anybody to go in an audit alone. Uh, just have a professional represent you, especially in this case. He was not really that nice of a person, so I knew it wouldn't be not nice to, for the IRS agent to see him. So, so I go to the IRS with this big stack of 
the records that we could find, and he had a lot of international travel. The first thing was, so where are the receipts, right? The IRS says that up until $75, you don't really need receipts. But here's the thing, again, coming back to common sense. If you have a couple of thousand dollars worth of Mielsen Entertainments, and you said, oh, that was all cash, I don't have any credit card bills or debit card statements or credit card statements or no receipts at all, not even for 10% of my expenses to cover them, that's fishy. So if you, you would say, oh, I found most of them, 90% of my receipts are here, they would say, you know, that's good enough. So any purchase above $75, you should keep the receipts, especially if it's a major thing, like office furniture or travel or lodging, for sure, if you travel. In this case, we had the credit card statements showing all the airline tickets. But the IRS agent said, okay, then how do I know this was for this gentleman and not his mother-in-law or his kids, right? So we needed to find the tickets, e-tickets, emails, whatever we needed to find. If you keep the bill and the proof of payment, like the copies of the bank statements and credit card statements, that's the best. Uh, sometimes people ask me, is it enough for me just to keep the credit card statements? Again, if all your purchases are under 75 bucks, it might be okay. But it's so much better if you have the receipts, the checks, and then the proof of payment that you paid for it. And not, okay, I could have a receipt for a uh, laptop, but how can I show that I paid for it and not my friend gave it to me as a gift or my grandma, right? So, so keep your receipts very organized and it's gonna help you, your tax pro, and also it's gonna help you in, in case of on an audit. Number nine would be 1099. And this is a new thing that uh, just came up when working with some of the Juice Plus distributors. When somebody told me, you know what? Um, I did pay 1,000 bucks to somebody to help me with office stuff. I said, okay, she needs to get a 1099. It's like, what? Or I gave a tower garden in lieu of paying somebody. It's like, okay, how much is that? Did you ever open a bank account and they had a price like a mini fridge or an iPad or something? I'm sure if you had this experience, then you got a 1099 at your end. So even if you do some work for somebody, you can expect, you did service, you can expect that you're gonna get a 1099. They're obligated by law to give you a 1099 if you earn more than $600. So if you are the person who pays somebody for services, you need to issue them 1099. You can go to Office Max and buy the forms. Unfortunately, we have this, so we give a 1099 to the uh, individual and send a copy into the IRS. So the IRS is sitting on it and say, okay, I have XYZ with this social security number. I have the 1099. I'm gonna wait to see the same amount, at least, on your tax return when I get it. And then when you have your tax return, the IRS computers match it. If they don't see that 1099 on your tax return, spits out a notice and comes directly to your mailbox saying, where is it? Where is that income? You're not paying tax on it. So if you hire somebody as a subcontractor to help you with office stuff, you need to give them a 1099. Like I said, unfortunately, this copy that we have to send into the IRS it's like in red, pre-printed, so it's not just like you can print it out from the internet. You can order them for free from the IRS. It takes about two months to get it. So most of the people just go and call their CPAs on January 30th, when the deadline is January 31st, saying, I need to issue some 1099s. Even if that was an award, the law says even for awards. So if you gave bonuses to any of your team members and they were more than $600, so I said even in form of cash, check, or any other stuff that you gave them that had value, that value should be under 1099. Even if that thousand bucks that you paid your assistant was 10 checks of 100 bucks, doesn't matter, it's still during the year, you pay them $1,000. Up to one person. Up to one person. So anything, up to one person, 600 bucks, if you gave them in awards, bonuses, or for services, 
you need to issue a 1099. And actually, three years ago, the, tax, the IRS started putting this question on the tax form. So your business taxes are on Schedule C. After the IRS asking you what's the business's name, does the business have any tax ID number, what is the activity that uh, you do, they're gonna ask you the following question. Did you, by law, have to issue 1099s to anybody? So you have to check off yes or no. Second line, if yes, did you do it or not? So technically, either you lie on the tax return saying I didn't, but then if you have subcontractor or office help, thousand bucks on the tax return, they could come back and say, uh, what is this? Was this thousand bucks to two people, so that's why you didn't have to? Or was it to one person, thousand bucks? And then in that case, where is the 1099? So basically, you sign the tax return and you have to certify if you did it or not. And just imagine what happens if you said, no, I didn't. I, I, I really think that it's an automatic notice that would come to you. So think about that. The 10 and the last tip is don't miss out on tax coaching. If you go to your tax preparer, and I don't care how good they are, if you go to them April 15th, again, they, don't, they cannot do anything. In some of the cases, I got clients where they came to me because they called their tax preparer during the year, and the person said, the CPA said, oh, just show up in March. I'm sure you're not gonna have any profits, it's fine. And the lady got offended, it's like, oh, I'm not gonna go back there. So you need tax planning. You need to know what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. You need somebody that is really there alongside you during the year that you can call them at any time with any questions. I got clients where I said, I, I want to change my tax accountant because every time I call them, just with lawyers, they start billing me the time they pick up the phone. So every time I call them, I got a bill for 60 bucks or 50 bucks because they work, I don't know, 150, 200, 250 dollars an hour, right? So if they're on the phone with you, when you wanna ask something for half an hour, that's gonna cost you, you know, 100 bucks. So then you tend to not call them. And then the problem just escalates and you're missing out on so many different things, opportunities, if you don't talk to them. This plan, tax plan, should be for your home, the big family tax picture, for your business, kids, should be an all-around um, all comprehensive plan. Maybe if you have your tax returns prepared by TurboTax, which the question is how much really tax advising does TurboTax give you? I mean, they're asking you some questions when you go through the wizards, but really, would they tell you that, hey, I see you had uh, $4,000 in medical expenses that you're claiming on Schedule A, and it's not even deductible, did you think about a MERP? I don't think TurboTax is gonna ask you uh, that question. And also, if you go to one of these chains where the person who prepares your tax return is literally paid minimum wage, like $8.95, and they just took two, 20 hours of, of whatever, H&R Block course. So if you, if you go that route, and it, it might work in some cases, but if you have a business and really want to be proactive, that's not the, that's not the, the route you, sh you should go. Unfortunately, a lot of CPAs even, they don't care about tax advising because they don't think the client would pay for it. They are not interested. And a lot of people might think that their CPA is really there, would call them or when reviewing the previous year's information, would tell them about opportunities to save, but they are not. So you should really look for somebody who's proactive, has webinars or different activities during the year to let you know what's out there, to call you. And this is my last question. When was the last time your tax advisor or tax pro called you up and said, here's an idea that I think will save you money? Yeah. Show of hands. So, so you are missing out on a lot. And tax coaching is, I mean, you, can, you, you know a lot of stuff, but here's the thing. Is there one single Olympic athlete that doesn't have a coach. Why, they don't know how to swim, they don't know how to run, 
they still have a coach. So don't miss out on text coaching. Be proactive and just remember that you lose every time you spend after tax dollars that could have been pre-tax dollars. So if you remember one thing, that's the thing that to remember today. And the last idea, just to throwing it out there, use your numbers to grow your business. Look at them. How much you spend on different categories, how much you need to take home if you earn more, where can you invest it back into the business? What can you do to grow your business? So not just for tax compliance, use your numbers to grow your business. So here is the picture of the book that we put together with my brother, and it doesn't have anything about tax in it. It's just nothing. And it's just 57 ways for serious little businesses about social media and marketing, how you can, uh, you can learn about uh, ideas that might grow your business. So thank you very much for having me today. And now it's Q&A time.